to introductions. That's me on the right, Patty Feltz, and together with my colleagues going from right to left, Nick Hayes, product owner of communication services at Ublox, and Neil Hamilton, Neil Hamilton, the global head of sales for Ublox services. Uh, we will walk you through this agenda for the webinar. We'll go a little bit over uh, services in general, provide you an overview, and then dive into the characteristics of IoT use cases that are relevant today. We'll talk about choices that one can make in communication protocols, and these choices are relevant. Um, and, and then dive into three different customer perspectives, that of cargo tracking, pet tracking, and community safety. We'll wrap it up with conclusions, have time for questions and answers, and then uh, let you know uh, some interesting things coming up next from Ublox. So with that, let's talk about um, just an overview of Ublox and our services, our product center. So we are offering the solutions that are essential for applications in IoT, that being wireless communication via a cellular network, via Bluetooth and Wi-Fi, the satellite-based positioning, uh, and the data services needed to establish the communication and to add functionality for location and security. We are a true one-stop shop for such solutions, and we're unique in our capability to provide these solutions from silicon to cloud. Yep, and next, and now in this webinar, we're gonna focus more closely in on the services product center of Ublox. Now in services, we aim to make it easy to connect and locate everything. And we offer services in combination with our products, which help to boost functionality, overcome challenging conditions, and solve those problems of complexity, cost, and availability. We do this in three key areas, and these are moving from left to right here, communication, location, and security as a service. Now for today, we're gonna zero in on the topic of IoT communication, the cloud there on the left and how making smart selections in connectivity and in protocol can have a vast impact on the power autonomy of your IoT devices. So with that, I now will hand over to Neil and Nick for the meat of our presentation. The stage is yours. Thank you very much, Patty. Good morning, good afternoon, uh, everyone, wherever you are. Uh, pleased to be here talking to you about communications today. Um, with regards to IoT communications and the various solutions, obviously it's you know they 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 come in different shapes and sizes and they're packaged very differently depending on the end applications. Uh, today we're going to focus more on those involving low power wide area technology, though some of the paradigms we'll talk around around saving power and things to consider are still relevant to the short range type applications, but we're not specifically focusing on, for example, Bluetooth tethering uh, for consumer applications and things like that. So I think today we'd like to just maybe start, some of you are probably very mature in understanding some of the challenges and some of the things that we're trying to achieve uh, in the industry today with IoT. Um, but a quick recap really on maybe the, the kind of most common behavior, the most common things we see uh, within new blocks and how we see consumers or customers using our uh, services. Typically, and here's some examples of actual products, and we'll come on to these companies later in the uh, presentation, but we see that you know the the raw payload size that we're talking about with many of these applications can range from maybe a few bytes maybe 50 bytes as we show here up to maybe half a kilobyte obviously in certain instances uh, we need to consider communicating back to these devices so in which case we might want to be updating firmware for example so then we appreciate the payloads temporarily might be larger because now we're sending you know firmware images over the air etc but in most cases, we see the sizes are very much in this kind of area. So relatively small. And if they're small, they really should be, you know, uh, efficient in the way they're communicated and, and help you save power in your overall design. The other angle here is we have size and then we have frequency. And again, we see some applications, you know, requiring maybe a device to wake once a week and send uh, conditions, it's monitored locally for a week across a cellular network, for example. 
Um, or many of these applications also might need more frequent, maybe within the minutes, and possibly <clears throat> when in the alarm states, uh, for example, with stolen vehicle or stolen uh, bike uh, scenarios, we might have to drop down to seconds for a temporary period of time because the application now requires a more frequent ping. So having flexibility in your designs to alter these is really important um, because again, when we deploy IoT for the first time, no one ever gets it right. We're constantly iterating our, our firmware design, our physical design, etc. So these are things we think are really important when customers are setting out on these journeys to not be rigid and set specific you know, hard parameters uh, around these these kind of designs of, of what you're putting together here. So again, frequency can vary. And again, uh, those small payloads on these different frequencies of, of what we see in most cases. And finally, the expectations of the battery. So again, if we you might have noticed we've reordered the uh, the images under here because what's happened here is, and we will look into this, you will have some long life um, cargo or asset tracking products which once deployed, no one wants to see them or touch them again. They are, they've, they've, they've gone for life, if you like. So between five to 10 years, maybe longer in some cases, these devices will be um, you know, dispatched and consistently send their payload at whatever frequency um, back. And so the battery choice is really important, but then everything we're gonna to cover today is critical for making the right choices to make sure we're not draining those batteries too fast. And on the other end of this um, scale, we obviously have something like pet tracking. And you can imagine here, uh, just like our iPhones um, or our, our phones or our personal devices, we're probably more open to charge these more frequently. So these devices can have much smaller batteries and the form factor of this particular type of collar that many of you may have seen, um, again, dictates that the components in here are also small. So there's this balance between how big a battery can we have to sustain the period, the expected period of life for a, an application, uh, you know, and what are the practicalities involved. So after we've looked at the physical aspects and we kind of think, okay, well, this is as large as I can go. This is the largest battery I can fit in a particular enclosure to go into a particular thing, if you will. Then we need to think about the consumption of the power. Now, we found that in many applications, uh, maybe a, an embedded designer will initially start looking at uh, possibly the radio options. And it could be whether it's a Sigfox or LoRaWAN or you know, a low power wide area network from a licensed provider. And again, we then start diving into looking at the, mo the modems themselves. What kind of power features do they have? Are they operating on the low power networks? Um, and, I th and we generally find, and Nick will cover some of this as well, we can be maybe too fascinated or too focused on this piece. The, the, you know, the modems are important because they give us the keys you know, to unlock and access the networks to send the data. But getting them paired correctly with a suitable antenna, again, these things make critical, the critical choices for power consumption. They're only one part of the overall solution. If you remember, we're trying really to make a, 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 a product with longevity, a solution that will last for a long time in the field. And does that really mean low power? Well, yes, but what components in our solution require this? And we believe one of the most significant kind of consumers of power in our solution <clears throat> is the protocol, the way in which we communicate from the device to the cloud. We need this to be a secured connection, and we know that security obviously can increase the overall payload size, because now the, old, the overall communication session has to be set up and secured. So that's gonna take more battery time and more bandwidth and more data. Um, and then the, the packages themselves, the actual, you know, the raw payloads, uh, they could be unnecessarily large because maybe certain protocols need more integers and characters than, than others. And this all takes up significant power. And we'll come on to this. So um, that's kind of setting the scene. We'll come back to some of those use cases uh, after uh, Nick can then kind of paint the picture more around how critical the choice of protocol is for these types of solutions. Yeah, thank you, Neil. Um, so yeah, so when we're talking about the different protocols in um, in IoT, there, there are many. Um, you hear a lot of talk at the moment about um, lightweight M2M um, and, and various other protocols. Um, with the uh, communication as a service product at ThingStream and, uh, and Ublox, we have uh, come to settle on MQTT um, as the standard that we use. Um, 
And so why did we choose that? Well, it's, uh, it's quite widely adopted across um, the world of IoT already. Um, it's quite a, a well understood protocol. It's very easy to use, it's reliable, um, it's exceptionally lightweight. Uh, it can handle bi-directional messaging, which is you know, really important, as Neil was saying. You have these devices where um, you want to be able to make changes to their configuration, <clears throat> have them uh, publishing more frequently in an alarm state and then going back to a less frequent update when they're in normal operation. So you need a way to be able to, to send those messages in, in both directions, which you can't do with, um, uh, with everything. Um, there's no polling, it's a publish and subscribe um, uh, protocol, so messages delivered from the broker when the, uh, when the client is connected. It doesn't have to be polling for those messages. Uh, and there is also um, a derivative of MQTT uh, for sensor networks, MQTT SN, uh, which is further tailored for, for the needs of power and bandwidth constrained devices. So the choice of protocol impacts your time on air. Um, we can see that with, um, I'll show you in a minute with some of the tests that we've done, um, but protocols like um, CoAP and TCP um, have a longer time on air than, uh, than we find with, with protocols like MQTT and especially MQTT SN. So what is it that with MQTT SN which, which adds this additional power saving features? Well, there are three separate um, things brought in uh, specifically by the SN variant. Um, first of all, there's topic aliasing. Now, MQTT can support quite complex uh, topic structures uh, going down into many different levels of, uh, of, of, of hierarchy. Um, and all of those <clears throat> topics require um, bytes over the air to, uh, to register and, and publish to, to the given topic name. MQTTSN allows you to uh, predefine these topics on the broker um, and assign them uh, an integer alias. So when you're uh, publishing and referencing those topics from your device, you just refer to the integer and not the entire topic structure. Uh, and this can save you many bytes over the air. There's also a sleep mode. Um, so uh, the MQTTSN client can tell the broker that it's, uh, it's going away for a period of time. Uh, during that time, the broker will queue up any messages that have been published to topics which the device has subscribed to. And then the, when the device checks back in um, towards the end of its sleep period, uh, it can then tell the server it's there um, and request that any queued messages are delivered to it. And that will then be done uh, by the broker. And then in addition, there's an additional um, quality of service level that MQTT SN offers. So the, the regular MQTT protocol has uh, three quality of service levels, fire and forget, um, deliver at least once and deliver exactly once. Uh, SN brings in an additional minus one level, which is a blind fire and forget. And this means that you can publish a message to the broker without first being in a connected state. Um, this is connected in the sense of MQTT. Um, so again, this saves you um, a number of messages over there. You don't have to connect and get an acknowledgement back. Um, you can just send that message off into the air. And that's um, quite useful for devices which are, are publishing uh, maybe sensor data quite frequently. Um, you don't need an absolute guarantee that every single message you send is, is delivered. Um, you just know that um, you, know, you can send it and, and forget about it. So let's have a look then at some of the testing that we did, um, looking at um, the, the, the power consumption and the time on air for, for uh, MQTT SN and other protocols. Now this test was done on a, um, on a CAT M1 uh, low power network, sending 100 byte payload. And we tested um, with a number of things. There was uh, just a normal UDP transmission using the uh, U-Blocks end-to-end data protection, which is part of the security services, um, which is, is covered on other webinars <clears throat> and on our website. There's also a, a TCP uh, transmission, again, using that end-to-end -end data protection. So this is where the, there's a security uh, component on, um, the, on the modem itself, available in our um, SARA um, 
R5 and R4 modules, um, which gives a secure root of trust ID um, to, uh, to encrypt and decrypt the payloads that you're sending. Um, so it gives you a, a lighter weight solution to, um, to security. And in the middle here, we have your traditional HTTPS uh, transmission um, using TLS. We then have a co-op connection using a pre-shared key. And then we have MQTT SN using ThingStream MQTT Anywhere. Now with ThingStream MQTT Anywhere, um, the data that you send from the device can be sent in plain text. Um, and that's because we have a, a private secure um, uh, APN. The traffic that's sent using ThingStream Anywhere is, uh, is not sent over the internet at any point. Uh, it runs through a, a, a private UDP tunnel. Um, and this enables you to, uh, to reduce um, the, the amount of effort and heavy lifting that you need to do on the device to get that data, uh, to get that data out. And as you'll see on the graph here, the time on air to send that 100 byte payload using um, MQTT SN uh, with ThingStream um, is significantly less than, uh, than all of the others, even the, uh, the next best, um, which is the, the UDP using um, Ublox's end-to-end -end data protection is still um, sort of double um, the time on air. And that translates to how much power you're using. Obviously, the more time you're on air, the more time that battery is connected uh, and draining. Um, and so your power consumption is increased as well. And again, you see um, the MQTT SN being the lowest, <clears throat> um, followed by uh, the two data protection um, uh, options, and then looking at co-app, um, uh, and, uh, and finally, um, HTTPS, um, which is uh, massively higher, as you see here. So as we touched on um, earlier, obviously security uh, also has an impact on the battery life. Um, if we look at um, sort of the traditional um, uh, mechanisms for securing the data using SSL and TLS, um, they have a massive impact on the, on the payload that you send. And we find often when talking to customers and we talk to them about uh, the, the messages they want to send, um, they tell us, oh, well, we're sending, you know, kilobytes of data. Um, and we say, well, you know, are you really, what actually is that payload that you're sending? Um, like the example here of a 26-byte um, a payload over the air, the actual payload itself is, is about 12 bytes in this test that we're going to look at next. Um, with, um, with MQTT SN, that's inflated with a, with a few of the headers um, to 26 bytes. When you're looking at um, SSL and TLS, that's up to nearly 6K, um, which is a huge increase um, and has a, has a very big impact on, on battery. So looking at the test that we did here, this was sending a simple hello world message um, using um, some different protocols. Um, we used um, 2G um, with uh, MQTT Anywhere. Um, this is where data is sent over um, USSD, which is part of the signaling layer on the networks. Um, and then on a full LTE Cat1 um, modem, um, using, uh, using UDP, um, again, to send the data, and then comparing that with HTTP with no security, and then the secured HTTPS. And you'll see that um, even with 2G, which customers um, think of as quite a power hungry um, way of, of, of communicating on, on the cellular networks, um, the actual relative uh, current uh, used uh, for sending this hello world message um, is still actually quite low um, because you don't have to go through um, all of that additional effort of setting up the security and uh, getting your TCP IP stack up and running and, and all of those extra bits which all um, take time um, these are these are removed um, and your and your relative power consumption is therefore uh, reduced um, but I think the most uh, best illustration of this is the graph on the right here where we're looking at um, the actual bytes over the air so uh, in the table here we're sending a, a just a 12 byte hello world message over the air um, on MQTT Anywhere with, uh, with the 2G variant, um, the actual uh, amount of data over the air was 26 bytes. Um, with, uh, with the LTE Cat1 going over UDP, slightly higher at 34. 
but then when you start looking at doing that over HTTP, um, the numbers just ramp up uh, rapidly. So um, just over a thousand bytes for uh, for a, a non-secured uh, message um, on HTTP, um, and then by 5.6k um, going over um, the the SSL layer. So that's a 473 times inflation factor for bringing that security in on uh, on HTTP transmissions. So now I'll pass you back over to Neil, who will talk to you a bit more about how our customers have looked at this, uh, some of the different use cases that they have, um, have brought to us and how they've solved those problems. Cheers, Nick. So yeah, absolutely. So coming back to some of those devices we saw in those opening slides, um, with kind of bearing what we just saw from Nick in mind, it's very interesting how some of these customers and many of our customers are now looking at you know, the use of the different radio networks a little differently in terms of fitting something with their business case and their business needs today, as well as allowing for what's coming in, you know, tomorrow in terms of the network evolution as well. So first of all, we're looking at a common application, cargo tracking. It's, an, you know, a, a, a customer of ours called Versa Design based in Spain. Uh, they provide different types of trackers uh, for either cargo or transport tracking, supply chain. But there's a common theme. They typically are devices that will go and live in the field, as I said earlier, between five to 10 years uh, with different types of you know, ping frequency. Typically, it's a daily ping frequency unless there's some alarm state, as Nick pointed out, is often the case. And people need that flexibility uh, in their solutions. Again, the challenge is here, and often we end up talking around bond costs, but it's not necessarily, again, the true reflection of a real operational cost of a, a solution. But you know, if you can get a, a an asset tracker to live 10 years and it's less than or around 50 bucks, that's a pretty interesting uh, business proposition because there is that unlocks many use cases around the world to enable um, you know more improved visibility of supply chain. So that's the market. I guess many of you are working in. We work in together, and it's very common. The other thing is it is here is these guys will be selling almost like a white label solution. So they'll be selling the the hardware um, and then the connectivity. Some customers will be buying the, the communication piece directly, but the key is they need to know what those prices are because one of the things that challenge certainly supply chain is yes, in that scenario, um, you know, a licensed cellular network usage is probably the right thing to do, but with roaming fees and certainly with food logistics, well, we can have cargo containers leaving ports of Africa and heading to Europe where they could be moving if they were using data in a regular format from 15 to $20 a meg uh, down to a few cents per meg in Europe. And that's not ideal when you're trying to predict what the actual cost of your business is. And given it's a dynamic business, things move and change and we're not always going to the fixed positions. So that was some of the challenges that this particular uh, customer faced on behalf of their customers as well. Uh, and finally, as we said earlier, to change alarm states or to provide maybe configuration changes because different customers need different ping rates at different times then having these devices manufactured sitting on shelves and then shipping them and then configuring them or customizing them when they're being deployed was really important rather than having, you know, um, almost like an NRE cost for setting up a custom firmware, uh, which isn't, again, it's prohibitive. And it also slows down uh, proof of concepts because we just go back to the drawing board almost and start rewriting firmware, what have you. So these were some of their, their challenges. Some additional challenges as well was very much around, well, the data itself. So yes, we can get a device in field. Um, predominantly, most of these were operating between Europe and Africa. Um, but each customer will often be using a different enterprise system to collect the data and actually build meaning and derive some value from the data. So having the device and you know having a SIM in there is only one part of that solution. And yes, okay, we've solved the the, the power consumption perspective as well, but we also need the data to arrive in a meaningful fashion. And again, we don't necessarily want a DevOps team or a, a third party you know, team having to configure web servers and create the formatting for the data and prepare it for any of these kind of branded upstream systems that large customers are using. Um, so again, there was a number of secondary challenges once we solved the physical and the network piece uh, for this customer as well. And if we look at their options, well, as we said at the start, you naturally, if you go and Google low power, you'll find no end of 
global roaming sims that now roam on you know uh, or claim they roam on sort of nb networks so nb iot is very popular uh, and again there's a lot of investment in nb iot and certainly in, the, in europe with the carriers so again you're going to see that uh, in some territories sigfox is is mature and others it's not um, and LoRaWAN, these are the three kind of flavors of, of low power wide area network that we see. There are others, and no doubt there'll be other contenders over time, but these are the ones that we see the most. Customers scratching their heads wondering which of these is going to be appropriate for their use cases. And, they, and again, it's easy to get hold of boards and test these things, and that can often lead to maybe too many choices. We're kind of blinded, we can't see what is the best decision. So we also always kind of zoom up and say well where is this device going to live what's the purpose of it how will the end customer value you know what is the, the customer proposition how many customers can they serve so if we start looking at some of these and these instances well for this particular customer sigfox wouldn't be necessarily correct uh it would be good for other applications but not specifically for this kind of you know this this fluid cargo tracking asset tracking kind of requirement which these devices could be going anywhere in the world almost uh, similarly for LoRaWAN, yes, you've got operators now running public LoRaWAN networks, and that's great. Uh, but again, the inter-roaming and the different standards across the world, you know, slightly vary. We might need different kind of combo modems for this uh, or radios. So again, it's not entirely clear. And what would the actual bomb of the final device be and where could it actually work? So there's some question marks around these, which probably make them prohibitive for this use case. So in the world of low power, we're naturally drawn to, you know, NBIoT and LTEM, which is commonplace, and we see them accelerating in their deployment globally now, with over 190 countries using cellular, uh, and many of those countries now having, um, you know, made announcements they're going to move to either turning their 2G off and refarming some of this for some of this spectrum. Uh, they have test labs running in Europe. We see NBIoT being fairly mature now across many territories. Uh, LTEM is often now appearing alongside in some of these countries. Um, but you go to the US and it's LTEM only. The MB networks haven't been adopted. So again, now if I'm making a, a, a cargo tracker or a tracking device that has to go anywhere, now I'm in kind of a bit of a problematic territory because is MB or is LTEM the right option for me? And again, we've got some other things to consider here, not just coverage, which is currently very patchy, but it is gathering pace. We see more roaming agreements now being uh, agreed between carriers to allow for roaming of LTEM um, and then when you get into the weeds of the modems themselves obviously including ourselves there are features available on the modems for PSM and EDRX um, well Nick any sort of comments here because we, we're learning more about how networks are behaving with just these features alone to make more confusion yeah absolutely so when it comes to, to looking at, um, at these additional power saving modes on the low power networks um, it actually turns out to be quite difficult to, uh, to predict what your uh, power consumption is going to be um, unless you know a lot about where that device is going to wind up. The networks themselves um, control whether or not these features are supported at all um, <clears throat> and also um, in terms of the timers and things that you will set, um, the requests that you make to the network uh, are purely that they're a request for a, spe a specific type of timer uh, and the network is not obliged to uh, to respect that um, so they can set these timers themselves um, and the the way that they're set can obviously have a, a massive impact on on your power consumption so a device that you think might have five years battery life from where you tested it in the lab actually when it goes out in the field because of the way timers are set um, may only have one year um, you also have to consider that if your device is roaming, um, whether or not these power saving modes are supported, um, again, is, is a factor of whether the operator has enabled it for roaming. So they may well have uh, really good um, settings for, for these low power modes <clears throat> if you have a, uh, an operator's own SIM, um, but they don't give those benefits to, uh, to roaming customers. Um, so the reality of this is that really unless you know exactly where your device is going to operate um, and you're able to go out and test it um, uh, you know on that network in that area um, it's very very difficult to um, uh, to get a good feel for 
uh, just how much benefit you'll gain from these uh, from these low power features. Um, and, and it may, uh, in some circumstances, actually um, sort of negate uh, the benefits uh, that, that you might have otherwise thought you were going to get. Thanks, Nick. Another aspect there as well is we see, for example, with MBIoT, many applications where, for exactly as Nick just said, we know it's for a metering application that's in a domestic market, and we know the configuration of how this is set up on the carrier network. So in those instances, you're working with things you know, and the, the parameters can be configured, and you will you know, uh, experience the benefits. Uh, it's just when you don't have all the information, it becomes problematic. If we then look at you know, the, the, the reality check for the coverage of this particular use case for as we explain the asset tracking, well, today's product um, is actually adopting a 2G a first approach. Um, yes, there is using one of our newer modules, uh, a redesign or you know, pin compatible uh, new version coming, which will have the LTEM support. Uh, but even then, even though we in our terminology uh, in the business, we say, oh, we need a modem that's LTM with 2G, 2, 2G fallback. In reality, we actually see this working the other way around. You kind of generally see it's 2G first, and then if there's no 2G, because we've arrived in Australia, which is a reality, uh, we need that option to fallback. Similarly with the US, for example, when I, I believe uh, T-Mobile may be end of life their, uh, their 2G support end of 2022. So we've got a plan for that. So it's thinking about the longevity of your device, where does it have to live, and do we need to build in some of this future proofing now by choosing the 2G and LTM version, or even a CAT1 version, because as you've seen from the power saving, you know, even though CAT1 modules can be more expensive, they could give us more exposure to more of the economies around the world, just because of now my battery can be you know, created or uh, maintained longer. So that was a reality check for this kind of deployment. Um, and as you can see, with, with this MQTT Anywhere offering that we have at Ublox, there is a global roaming SIM. It does enable this kind of, you know, MQTT SN enablement that's secured inside our own network, if you will. Um, in addition, th that problem of the data, that second challenge of getting the data into upstream systems. Well, if the data is flowing into the Ublox ThingStream platform, there are already configured nodes to enable you to enter credentials for these upstream systems, and the data just flows into them in their required formats. So again, from a device manufacturer, OEM, ODM kind of perspective, that's a relief because now your, your products are more appealing to more audiences because that piece is taken care of as well. It's not just about building a device with a SIM tray that you then slide any SIM in. This is a, an end-to-end -end solution, as Patty said at the start, that is solving a whole number of problems uh, in one go here. The final aspect as well, which is, again, worth, you know, it's very much worth considering, if you have designed such a device as our, our customer here has, well, they may sit on the shelves uh, for a while until customers might buy quantities of them. But purely the commercial uh, offering from Ublox ThingStream is also, it's a pay-as-you-go model. So if these devices aren't adding value to anybody, they shouldn't really be paying for them. So again, the way in which the, the whole subscription works, which includes the you know, the, the roaming, the data, the line rental, the SIM activation, all of that is wrapped up inside these, these services. And again, they're purely on demand, which again fits brilliantly with the business model, which is, well, we don't need the entire fleet turned on immediately because we haven't deployed them all. So things to consider in, in the whole concept here is talking about, you know, the strategies for, for using IoT and low power. And as I said, finally, we've got these, you know, the delivery platform itself, many of you may have uh, already created domains uh, and seen that there's these additional adapters uh, to solve some of those problems. And that means even the end customer could come in here and, and maybe add further logic. Uh, we, we spoke about alarm states earlier. They could build some alarming capabilities as well or some geofence capability um, if needed to process the data before it arrives in their enterprise platform. Similarly, then, if we take a look at you know, pet tracking, again, a common and growing um, you know, phenomena, specifically our customer, uh, Paul Track, they focus on, as you can see, on tracking cats, which uh, you know, there is a different behavior uh, needed in the device for the way cats will, will roam, if you will, and the way they, they, they wander around, and there's various different attributes that make them very different to tracking maybe a, a, a dog that's run off, if you will. Again, the challenge here is, and this is very common uh, around the consumable kind of consumer market, where ideally you want to make 
as, as least number of SKUs as possible. Ideally, one SKU that will just work anywhere in the world. Uh, so again, one of the challenges here is size. We've got the form factor is clear. It's very limited in our space on a PCB. So our choice of radio, again, we do need a cellular modem or a modem in here. Um, so again, that needs to be considered. Um, and these need to be relatively power efficient. Yes, the, the cats come home. We can char charge those collars or have a second collar on charge. Um, so the frequency is far, far greater than the trackers we dispatch for forever. Um, but the whole solution here from the customer perspective was they just need it to be easy. This is what they do. They provide you know, value added service for cat owners. They're not necessarily really an IT company that wants to build all of the IT side and the cloud piece just to get the data. So again, that was the challenge. Similarly, looking at our options, again, in this particular use case, Sigfox wasn't necessarily the right option. LoRaWAN, again, in some countries arguably could, but it wasn't the choice because we need a generic solution, ideally. And then again, similarly, the footprint of cellular and the low power cellular, as we see it's advanced in rollout, uh, is obviously the right, right kind of option when you, you have an e-commerce store and you want to sell to as many countries in the world. So that was the driver here. We need to address the biggest, you know, the largest um, addressable customer base effectively. But again, as to Nick's point earlier, low power, well, again, we need to perhaps think about where these might work. Because again, once we sell them, we don't want consumers sending those devices back to us. So in this instance, the strategy has very much fallen into a two modem strategy. You've got almost 2G for rest of world, uh, and then specifically for the US market, uh, an LTE M variant, um, and other markets where that can be supported as well. So that's kind of the, the strategy here. And very much, you know, having the confidence to dispatch these products, the appropriate SKUs, the appropriate territory, and knowing that the data will just, you know, when the device, you know, the seal's pulled and the device wakes up, that two things happen. The data flows seamlessly into the platform. And again, I, this customer doesn't necessarily want a large DevOps team to maintain the cloud service and all the application side. So again, we can, you can see how we can take care of all that here. And again, some of these might sit in boxes for a while or customers might turn them off. Um, then they shouldn't, you, know, you ultimately pay for the value. Don't pay just because we have a, a two year contract with a, a carrier, um, which isn't necessarily, you know, it's, it's not always ideal. So an interesting option there, the strategy is very much a, a two SKU strategy. And then the final use case is the other product we had on here, which is a, a, almost like an IoT gateway. The product you see here is uh, from a company, a part, customer we work with in South Africa called Lumkani. Uh, and this is actually a, uh, a, a mesh network. So these are uh, devices which actually uh, provide fire safety in townships um, in different parts of the world where maybe power isn't possible. There's no power coming to some of this informal housing. Uh, and therefore the ability to provide fire safety to prevent lives being lost when there's maybe oven fires uh, in a home then you need to effectively solve that problem in some way using IoT. So you had that um, device on the previous slide, which is very much the device that's given to the, the homeowner. This is a simple plug and play. You, you kind of hammer the device with a, a nail fitting you know, to a, to a wall. And if there's a fire, you can press the button, but it will also detect if there's a fire or there's smoke and it will mesh. It will talk to all of the other uh, you know, nodes that are around the township. And so it creates a sent an automatic response for the local community to to you know get on top of the problem with the fire. But in addition, these talk to a gateway, and so Lumkani need to know the behaviour of the township, the products, how they're running, how they're operating, have there been any false alerts, real alerts, many different use cases. But again, there's no power for the gateway to operate. So when we're now dealing with countries such as Bangladesh or Sri Lanka. Um, we need, we need to be able to uh, you know, provide a, a solution that, that will work and guarantee getting this data into the cloud. Really important for them. And it has to be out of the box as well because they're dispatched and they have to just go to maybe a community leader who will train people on how to use them. So interesting, the project started, I believe, in South Africa and it spread beyond. Uh, but initially, Sigfox has got a strong network in South Africa. There is good coverage there. Um, and for different types of applications. And this, this is kind of a, you know, one of those types of applications. But because we were looking at other territories or the customers looking at other territories as well, it didn't quite fit. It would be ideal to have a single 
solution really. Um, LoRaWAN, no public available networks as yet in these territories. Uh, and again, NB and LTE, this low power, not available and not and probably won't be for many, many years, uh, just because the geographical places where some of these requirements are. So it's quite an extreme kind of view of IoT. It's not an edge case, it's very common. There's lots of IoT being deployed in these territories, uh, but it just gives you another example of, well, hang on, what is my options? I need low power. I need, I need something, a gateway that's gonna last for a long time. So again, the, the, the 2G and LTE are really the only two licensed networks, let alone low power, that will provide the footprint for this customer and their customers. Uh, so again, by applying what Nick explained earlier and looking at the tests to see that actually you can derive a low power solution from these networks, that's pretty exciting and that enabled the customer to bring this to market. So again, you have a, you can see the image here, it's, a, it's a, uh, an IoT hub that talks to hundreds of these gateways and will periodically upload a larger payload, you know, nearer that half a kilobyte on an infrequent basis. Um, but again, it's it's powered. The strategy here is also to provide solar to keep this topped up so you can trickle charge from a solar cell. Uh, but everything is about preserving the power. And you can see again how, how this fits brilliantly with the use cases um, that we've presented here. So it's a slightly different view. We're trying to show you today that there's more than just the radio piece itself. There is a much broader set of things that will be consuming the power in these, uh, in these uh, use cases. So I guess some of the conclusions, and we can look at some of the questions in a moment. As I say, it's the connectivity is only one part. As Nick pointed out, if we're using maybe certain protocols, regardless of how low power our modem is, is purported to be, the protocol will still keep that you know, device communicating over the, the, uh, the radio network into the internet for far longer than it should. So protocol is really important. Um, and, and as we can see, when we scale these solutions, we need predictable pricing. We need to know what the actual costs will be. Uh, and we think this is really important when we start looking at the total cost of ownership with our customers. We just, we kind of uh, look up beyond just the bomb, the actual de device design and look at the overall requirement and try to help build an overall smarter strategy in how they adopt IoT. So Patty, I've not been paying any attention to um, the questions. Um, or Nick, I don't know, should we take a look at some of those? Yes, actually Nick's been paying attention and there's one or two questions from an attentive uh, registrant. Uh, so Nick, would you like to share uh, about the question and answer? Yeah, let me just see if I can <clears throat> get a good view on this. So the question was, um, apart from battery impact, um, don't you think MQTT doesn't behave well in uh, bad radio conditions uh, due to it running on TCP, um, which has some issues with, with latency? Um, and uh, so, yeah, I mean, in answer to that, um, the probably part of the reason why using SN for these um, bandwidth constrained devices is um, uh, is perhaps more appropriate. So we use um, kind of regular MQTT uh, in the in the enterprise to cloud kind of communication scenario. Um, so where you have your your backend systems talking to the broker, which then in turn talks on to the uh, the devices out in the field. Um, so you you then have a typically you know a good strong um, internet connection, um, and and you're not not dealing with um, uh, you know radio signal issues uh, when you come to MQTT SN which is what we we use for devices out on the field um, again with this being particularly tuned um, to, to deal with that scenario um, using those additional um, sort of low power low bandwidth features like the topic aliasing uh, and the, uh, the fire and forget method um, and our <clears throat> secure private UDP network um, then all of those factors together reduce the number of bytes over the air, which reduces the amount of time uh, on air, um, and also the uh, the amount of protocol chatter is reduced if you're using that quality of service minus one that we spoke about earlier. 
Um, so all of those factors um, help to uh, improve reliability of that messaging. So, and we see in cases where you know the uh, signal strength is is relatively low, um, and you may struggle to uh, to do comms um, with with some of the other protocols. Um, we are able to get successful messages backwards and forwards using MQTT SN, and that's why we've, we've chosen that SN variant for uh, for those types of devices. Thanks, Nick. Another great question uh, regarding batteries. You know, what type of battery do you use in these sort of situations? I mean, we see a, a real spread depending on the use case. Uh, even a growth in custom custom made designs in terms of their sizes. Uh, but Nick, what chemistry would you say? I mean, we don't particularly get super close to that necessarily, but what, what do you think we've seen the most? Um, so a combination of things, obviously on the rechargeable devices <clears throat> that we've seen, um, then uh, those simple lithium ion batteries um, that, that, have, that have been used. Um, we did some tests um, uh, a couple of years back with uh, um, a tracker device, um, running on a, on a 2G modem, which had a simple 800 milliamp hour lithium ion battery in it. Um, and that was able to do um, something like eight, 900 um, transmissions of data. So this is wake up, um, get a GPS lock, um, send that data over the air and go back to sleep. Um, and it was able to do that um, eight, 900 times um, from, a, from a single charge of that battery. Um, so that was um, that was quite an interesting one. And then on the, um, I'm trying to think what the actual battery technology used in that B-Track device was. Um, I don't recall now, to be honest. Um, but that was able, again, that's running on kind of a D-cell sized battery. Um, and, uh, and the manufacturers of that device um, warranty the battery life for, for 10 years. Um, so relatively small batteries um, capable of, of providing that uh, that longevity and that again is on a uh, on a 2g um, modem and they're seeing similar um, life expectancy with the uh, with the new um, combined 2g and LTEM variant that they're working on thanks Nick Okay, good. I think that's all our questions. Uh, oh no, we have more. They're popping up. So let's have a look. Uh, do you have a dev kit to test these functionalities? Um, yes, we do, or we very shortly will have. We're actually currently working with a number of, um, of partners who produce uh, produce boards. Um, so one particular one with Sodak, um, who have a couple of um, Arduino boards. Um, we're working now on on some example projects, so a, a tracker example and a, and a regular kind of Hello World example, um, so the customers will be able to buy these boards with the um, the SDK and the and the example applications pre-installed. Um, so they just have to insert a SIM and um, and then they're good to go. Um, we have SDKs available for download. Um, via the ThingStream portal for um, a multitude of, uh, of MCUs. Um, so STM32, Arduino, um, uh, and, and the ARM uh, Cortex uh, modems are all supported. Um, and the SDK bundles, again, have example projects in them, so you can get up and running quite quickly and, and test these things out. Um, so where they're, while you're sort of waiting for um, official uh, uh, boards to become available um, you can pick up you know pretty much any developer board um, from uh, from these distributors um, and 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 sort of thing stream enable it um, so to, to get that um, those prototypes working um, and the support team um, are on hand to help with any uh, SDK integration uh, questions that you have as you, as you start to look at it Thanks, Nick. Next question, I can take this one from, from David. Thanks, David. Um, it's basically, you've mentioned 2G and LTE, but in Australia, of course, and other territories, Japan, et cetera, uh, 2G's gone. And so what are the, what are the options there? From a, from a global roaming perspective, 
well, obviously, having a, one of these LTE M modems with the 2G4 back still gives you that, that kind of coverage because obviously roaming into and onto the LTM network, I believe Telstra um, is, is viable. However, Telstra, and it's commonly known, it's very problematic to permanently roam in Australia on the Telstra network. So if it was a domestic application where you know the device will just live and they have a fantastic, if I remember correctly, great um, geographic coverage compared to other carriers as well for remote areas, then um, you know that's going to be your best option. It's it's harnessing you know the, the the best protocols and battery mix along with one of their local sims because again as I think our, our, Nick I don't know our period of time of roaming whether it's 90 days or 120 days um, but most roaming sims will will expire after a period of time in territory so it's a good it's a good question some countries we find Australia Turkey Brazil those kind of problematic geographies where the roaming becomes a challenge and you need to think about uh, maybe that second skew option. Uh, if you uh, if you're selling something that's going to permanently live in those territories, uh, what else do we have here? What is the best module you offer for GPS and LTE M? What's the range? Um, we are really from the, the services division of Ublocks, but I would say what we have seen uh, in adoption is very much as Nick mentioned. The uh, the R four twelve is the current version, but the R four twenty two. Is becoming popular with the M8, so it has a, uh, a GNSS receiver uh, baked into it as well. And then again, for, uh, for pure LTM, we have an R5 M8 as well. Uh, the pricing, I don't know, uh, but we can route you to someone who will know that uh, in your uh, territory. So we'll take that question and come back to you on just introducing you to the right person to give you some information on that. Um, we have two more questions. What other components contribute to low power solution other than just the connectivity? Uh, well, Nick, with the sensors themselves and the application code is quite important, isn't it? Making sure you've got you know, very neat, tidy application code that isn't necessarily doing things it shouldn't be. Yeah, indeed. So you do need to take care when writing that application code um, in terms of you know, what you're doing, uh, how long you're keeping the, the processor awake for, um, making sure that the as neil said the code is kind of tidy and efficient itself that it's not just sort of running around keeping everything powered up longer than it needs to um, you need to consider quite carefully um, retry strategies so there will be cases where you know a device will wake up and, and you know maybe there isn't any um, network coverage in that particular place at that particular time um, and so you need to think about how many times do you retry um, you know, how long do you, do you spend um, in doing that? Um, do you just decide, okay, I'm going to wake up again in an hour anyway, so the fact that this message can't get through doesn't really matter, so I can just shut down? Or is it really critical that I keep trying and, uh, and push on? And again, looking at the kind of the mode that your application is running in, is it running in alarm mode where it needs to um, really try very hard to do things? Um, also, with tracking applications, um, you know, considering things like your uh, your timeouts for uh, for getting um, uh, positioning lock. You know, how long am I going to keep this um, GPS receiver powered up, scanning for satellites when maybe the um, device is in an underground car park and it's never going to get it? Um, so there's no point sitting there for 10 minutes trying to get a lock when it's never going to happen. Um, so a lot of things uh, around there, and again, there are some other uBlock services uh, coming to market now. Um, for example, the Cloud Locate service, which we launched a couple of weeks back, um, which help with with that kind of thing. So devices that don't need to know their location themselves, um, they just need to tell the cloud where they are. Um, and so we have some uh, some solutions there for um, taking uh, just raw GNSS measurements from the receiver um, and sending those to the cloud where uh, we have a service that can then calculate the, the position um, using the, the raw readings. And, and in a lot of cases, uh, you know, you can have a receiver that's just on air for a few seconds um, and that will give you enough data to um, have a location which is accurate to, you know, around 10 meters. Um, so there are uh, some other um, services on the way that will, will further help to um, 
to reduce power consumption on the device. It's not, um, as we say, it's not all just about um, the radio technology and the protocol. There's a whole load of other things on the application and the use case that you need to think about. Thanks, Nick. I'm conscious of time. Let's just take maybe uh, one more question and then um, any that aren't answered, we will come back to you. Some of them might actually need someone else to respond to them um, anyway. So we'll, we'll circle back around. Last one here is, um, is MQTT compatible with any cloud provider as it is, uh, as it is, or do you need additional conversion? Uh, well, Nick, you could take that one, but it is an open standard. So absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, there are a number of, uh, of services which offer um, uh, MQTT connectivity. So um, AWS has it, um, Google Cloud does, um, uh, IBM Watson and Azure all have um, MQTT endpoints that, that you can connect to. Um, you need to consider um, the kind of levels of support that they have. So some of those um, don't allow uh, you to connect to uh, other brokers from uh, from their side, so for, for downstream messages, it can uh, it can get tricky. Um, but certainly, MQTT is a is an open standard, widely adopted, available on a number of platforms. Um, and for those platforms that don't have MQTT, um, then the uh, the uBlock SingStream uh, data workflow tool has other connectors, so you can publish MQTT um, into SingStream. Um, and then uh, through one of the, uh, the data flows, uh, then turn that into an HTTP post um, to go out to the backend system that way. And similarly then, <clears throat> data coming, uh, coming back the other way from the enterprise uh, can be published using HTTP. Um, we have a REST API which allows uh, MQTT messages to be published um, using an HTTP post, um, so you can then um, send messages back to your devices out of the field that way as well. So a whole load of uh, different options available um, in the case that MQTT isn't available on your back-end system. Brilliant, thanks Nick. Okay great, as I said we'll follow up with some other, I see some other questions that come in so we, we will come back to you on those. Uh, we're, we're getting short on time so um, Patty back to you. All right. Thank you very much, guys. And uh, thanks for attending our webinar. We'd like to leave you with a couple of things uh, next up to consider. Um, uh, watch your email because we'd like to provide you with the opportunity to try our MQTT Anywhere SIM card to unlock that power of MQTT protocol. Um, we have a little uh, SIM card test trial. Um, there's a, a get started guide wallet that encapsulates it. So if you're interested in that, give a click and we can get you that trial offer. Also coming up on May 11th, Nick mentioned this um, location in the cloud. We are having a webinar on May 11th about that service. So devices don't necessarily need to know their location. They can send measurements up into the cloud and all this is calculus is done in the cloud and the location is provided and that gives vast power savings over traditional uh, GNSS power saving techniques. So if you're interested, we'd like to invite you to that webinar. All right, well, we thank you again. The, the hour is concluding. Thanks for your attention and thank you for joining. Have a good day.